Welcome to um, Alville's uh, webinar on uh, safe pace, pest management practices in commercial real estate. Um, we're very much looking forward to this uh, chat today. So a quick note on Alville. Um, we're a company that helps uh, building support pollinators at their uh, locations. Uh, we run educational programs at those locations, and we've recently started monitoring uh, nature and biodiversity at, loca at those locations and building out reports uh, that align with global frameworks for um, those customers. We work on 2,200 buildings across Canada, the US, the UK, France, Germany, Belgium, Netherlands, uh, and we work with some of the largest uh, commercial real estate owners uh, out there. We're hosting a um, webinar today on pest management and pesticides because we've recently launched a pesticide monitoring product for commercial real estate buildings. Um, it's a strip that goes inside the hives, inside the beehives that are on the locations. And because bees capture all these uh, particles around the environment around them and they visit the trees and shrubs and flowers and, and water all around the building, when they come back in the hive and walk over this strip, we get a lot of information, capture that back into a report and give a sense of the different molecules that have been found in the environment around the building. So we've launched that a few uh, months ago and uh, we decided to run this, this uh, webinar, not so much to talk about the product per se, but to talk more about pesticides and pest management. And so that's why we have Cam uh, Lay that's with us today. Cam Lay is a former state uh, pesticide regulatory official. Uh, he's an entomologist. He's an expert in pesticide regulation. Uh, Cam has a strong background in managing pest control programs. He holds a bachelor in science in entomology, a master in science in biology. Uh, and he's held leadership roles, uh, including the director of the main board of pesticide control uh, and various positions at the Montana Department of Agriculture and Clemson University. Thank you so much, Cam, for being with us uh, today. Thank you. That's quite an introduction. I was wondering who that guy was. <laughs> um, and I'm Alex McLean. I'm um, a beekeeper myself. I've, I've kept bees for um, the last 15 years, so I'm very close to that, that world. And I'm um, co-founder and CEO of Alveol. We're, we're a team of about 200 people uh, that work across these 2,200 buildings to make sure that we have bees and other pollinators that are doing um, uh, uh, doing some good work on these on these buildings. Uh, and so uh, glad to be running that today. Pesticides and pest management is something that's actually close to my heart. So um, um, uh, that's why we're talking about today. Um, as a general uh, kind of just uh, um, just starting off here on the general um, introduction. Um, the webinar is about safe pest management in commercial real estate. And the reason safe is important, uh, there's kind of three big aspects there. There's the compliance piece. Uh, pesticides and their applications are regulated. Uh, and in order to be compliant, we have to follow those regulations. And so we're gonna talk about the regulation today and those different pesticides, uh, but really the idea is to do it in a safe way. Um, Safe pace, safe pace management, pest management, sorry, um, also drives tenant and environmental health. So in urban areas, uh, a lot of the customers that we speak to say, well, we only have a, a small footprint, right? Are there really these pesticides that are used in, in my local environment? The answer is yes, there are a ton of pesticides that are used from cleaning windows to killing weeds and spiders and rodents. And so those can be a real threat to tenant health, um, but they're also an environmental threat um, I've uh, personally seen uh, full beehives with 50,000 bees die in a few hours because of non-compliant uh, practices on pesticides at buildings. So it's very uh, near to my heart to doing this properly so that, there's, so that the uh, local environment can thrive. And we'll, you know, the, the, the idea around also safe pest management is that it actually drives also property value. Uh, a lot of the green building certifications today include uh, things like IPM, integrated pest management, which we'll talk about today, uh, and gives, you know, automatic points for some of these certifications. And two, um, at, you know, as part of building value, attracting and retaining tenants, uh, doing this properly is a great way to tell tenants that uh, the building is going above and beyond uh, and that you can show tenants actual reports and actual data showing that the building is a safe place for them and for the environment around them. So those are kind of the three tenants of safe uh, pest management. And the general topics that we are going to tackle today. Um, so the topics are, uh, we're gonna talk about pesticide application in commercial real estate. We're gonna talk specifically about commercial real estate. Uh, we're gonna talk about the regulatory uh, environment. Uh, what does it mean at the federal and the state level? Um, and, and that's why Cam is with us today. He has extreme knowledge on, on, the, uh, on, the, uh, on, on this. And so we'll, we'll guide us through that. 
Um, we'll talk about the environmental and health uh, considerations. So, you know, what happens uh, for tenants, what happens for bees, what happens for other things of, na of uh, nature around the building. We'll talk about best practices, safe pesticides, and we'll try to finish in a, uh, you know, relatively concrete way of alternatives that, that uh, buildings can, uh, can use. So that's the plan for today. Enough of me uh, talking here. I'll, I'll pass it over to to Cam here. Um, Cam, let's start with just you know very broadly a bit of general awareness. Um, can you just kind of walk us through the different types of pesticides? We get a lot of questions around you know what's the difference between herbicides and pesticides and what are the different categories of pesticides. So just as a general kind of first uh, question here, can you just talk us through sure. uh, the different types here? <clears throat> sure. Let me know if you if you can't hear me. Um, I, uh, pesticide is a generic term. It includes everything you see listed on your, on your slide. Uh, that is, uh, they're subdivided into categories depending on the target organism. Colloquially, you'd say, uh, you'd say the thing you want to kill, um, in the pesticide business and the pesticide world. Uh, we don't talk about killing things. Um, we talk about controlling them or managing the population, uh, just like we we try. And I, my fellow regulators would disown me if I didn't say that we don't use the word safe either. The, the concept is that when these products are used according to the label instructions, which are essentially an exhaustively researched instruction manual that has the force of law, they don't pose a risk that the average person would find uh, unreasonable. That varies by category, of course. Um, a lot of your herbicides really don't do much to us uh, mammals or even us vertebrates, for that matter. Uh, rodenticides, obviously, are much riskier. All of the fumigants are much riskier. And in the both the state and the federal system, there are specific requirements for both training uh, equipment uh, for supervision that are based on the particular hazards of a given product or particular hazards of a given class. Okay. Um, and thanks for correcting me on the safe part here. Uh, yeah, that's just, that's one of those hot button things for 30 plus years, you know, <laughs> it gets beaten into your head. You don't say safe, you say reasonable risk. So. And that's what I think uh, the general awareness today and kind of talking through these topics is is the is I think what what uh, um, customers want right and getting that that understanding. Yeah. Um, so we've talked a few of these different types. Um, going on that question of okay, I have a, a building in an urban area. Which of these would actually be applied in an urban area and specifically around a commercial real estate building? You are probably never going to see a fumigant unless you oh. are. Uh, unless you're in Southern California or South Florida, someplace where there's a dry wood termite problem um, and the building is built out of out of wood. Most commercial buildings don't have a lot of wood in them. Uh, you probably won't see any fungicides. Uh, you might in the form of disinfectants, uh, mold prevention, mold and mildew products, even uh, anything that says it's a disinfectant, even Clorox has an EPA registration number and technically is a pesticide. Uh, you certainly will see rodenticides um, because we all have problems with rodents in, uh, in urban environments. Uh, they should be in a locked bait station that is fastened down either to the substrate or uh, uh, sometimes they'll mount them on a concrete block just to keep people from dragging them off and taking them uh, just to keep uh, uh, dogs, other animals there from dragging the station off. Um, a lot of, anti there's basically two classes of anticoagulants or of uh, rodenticides. Um, the anticoagulants there are treatments for, um, some of the other ones, uh, there's really not a whole lot you can, you can do. Um, you're going to see herbicides because buildings and grounds, uh, you're going to see insecticides because pest control. Um, most of the most of the violative cases that I worked when I was a field investigator uh, in South Carolina uh, were involved insecticides, uh, most of which had been used improperly inside. Uh, pest control guy sprays the baseboards, even though that's not a great technique. It's what people want to see. 
um, and sprays uh, somebody's lunch bag or somebody's uh, sprays right over somebody's feet. Um, uh, you see all sorts of you see all sorts of stuff. But in a commercial environment, you're going to see herbicides outside, possibly insecticides inside, and probably some rodenticides around the dumpster. Which I think is is really interesting, right? The, the the fact that this is not just something that is applied outside the building, but actually inside the building. Um, when yeah. we make the link with with tenant health and 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 this uh, uh, these practices, I think it becomes right. really, really a lot important. of places have rules about you know no food in your desk or uh, clean up the break room that kind of thing. But I have uh, I have not yet worked in a uh, in an environment despite those rules where people didn't have snacks in their desk and uh you know messes in the break room we'll continue on the topic here of law uh, and science and moving into kind of regulations uh can, can you kind of talk us through um regulations state and federal level how are sure. how are um these decisions taken our policies determined um yeah just walk us through yeah. that a bit in in the united states uh the federal government kind of sets the minimum level of performance and then the states are free to uh, I hate to say experiment, but uh, there is variation at the state level beyond that. Uh, the environmental considerations in a state like South Carolina are very different than those in a state uh, like Maine, uh, as is the cultural tolerance for large-scale agriculture, pesticides, that kind of thing. And both of those are completely different from, uh, uh, from Montana. Uh, South Carolina has an out-and-out -out badge and gun program. Their inspectors in the pesticide arena are law enforcement officers. Um, there are 14 or 15 of them, and they focus uh, largely on, uh, or to a large extent, on uh, structural pest control. That's probably at least 50% of the, of the caseload. Uh, in Maine, uh, most of the caseload was agricultural or environmental. Uh, in Montana, it is rare to find a structural pest control uh, use, um, really. There's just not. The agriculture here is uh, uh, is square miles of wheat. That doesn't bring people into conflict with agricultural operations. So our regulations in Montana are very, very different than the regulations that I wrote for South Carolina. Uh, policies are determined... You know, you hear the old expression, the two things you never want to watch are uh, sausage making and legislation. Policies are ideally determined by getting input from the public and taking their concerns into account, uh, uh, including the concerns of the industry, of course. Sometimes that's a mess. Uh, we managed to muddle our way through. So far, so good. Safety standards, you know, I touched on this earlier. It's uh, uh, it's not safe. It's it's is the risk acceptable. Um, in some environments, you can't simply can't grow crops without using pesticides. Um, that, uh, you know, I guess that's a, I'm sure there are people out there shaking their heads, but uh, uh, on a large scale industrial basis, you need those chemical inputs. The trick is to get the benefits without, without having too much risk, without exposing people. Uh, in urban areas, people are much more sensitive. Uh, in rural areas, I mean, for, for my parents, both of my parents grew up in South Carolina. For my parents, uh, a hot date was my mother sitting on the fender of the tractor while my father dusted the cotton, probably with toxaphene, which is a very old product that's uh, uh, carcinogenic and toxic and persistent and has all the characteristics you won't you don't like, except for the fact that it does it did at that time control cotton insects. Uh, in an urban environment, uh, there's a lot more sensitivity. You would not, uh, you would not see that. Uh, people think if they can smell something, their their uh, their health is at risk. Uh, sometimes they're right. Usually they're they're not. Okay, so you've uh, walked us through the general um, types of pesticides. We now talk about the kind of regulations, how it's built, and the difference between urban and, and rural, and how it's done kind of at the state level in different states. Uh, going and zooming in more onto the building side now, uh, which I think is most of the audience that would be uh, listening today. What is the role that commercial real estate plays, I'll say, in the general uh, reduction of pesticides? And, and what are the kind of general trends are you, that you're seeing at the moment in, in commercial real estate? Commercial buildings are are 
very well suited to use low impact, uh, low chemical use, integrated integrated pest management. Um, there's not a lot of resources in these buildings, so your pest problems tend to be tend to be concentrated. Again, the the break room, uh, somebody who's got food you know food in their desk that isn't cycled out regularly. Um, you can do a lot for pest control with exclusion, um, sealing up holes, caulking seams, that kind of thing. Uh, I, the cases that I have worked involved in commercial real estate or schools or something other than residences have generally been uh, human error. They've been, somebody has gone in there, gotten behind on the schedule, done something they're not supposed to. They have run out of the approved product and they have just this one time substituted something else. Uh, generally, commercial real estate is, uh, you know, non-residential real estate is a pretty low, low pesticide use environment. Okay. And so it would be a good place to to uh, uh, take advantage of some of these practices that we're going to talk in a yeah. second. That, it that, is an that, excellent yeah. place for integrated pest management. Yes. And if we stay on this topic here on and uh, move more to the landscaping of some of these buildings, I know that you've been brought in um, when people are, or, you know, when commercial buildings are redesigning their landscaping, um, how do you kind of guide them through what would be an interesting landscaping, something that would, um, you know, be uh, less less reliant, let's say, on, on intensive pesticide use? Uh, what are the different actions, I guess, that you suggest, right? It's, it's very site specific, uh, and it depends on what, uh, what people want the building to look like. And that's usually the consideration. We want the building to look like this. And then after the fact, they hire a landscaping contractor to take care of uh, take care of the grass, take care of the plant beds, that that kind of thing. Um, I haven't been heavily involved in uh, green buildings, building design, that kind of thing. My my environment or my involvement in these kinds of things is usually after the fact when it goes wrong. Um, one way to avoid that is, of course, to design the landscaping so that it it doesn't require a great deal of of maintenance. Um, that's easier in some parts of the country than it is in is in others. If you want grass around your building in South Carolina, uh, you're going to have to water it. You're going to have to treat it for insects. You're going to have to treat it for fungus. Um, and you know that is just the nature of the the nature of that environment. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's partly why um, we developed this this kind of new product that we launched on the on the, on the monitoring side, right? It was so that because um, we get those requests from a lot of customers, right? We we think we're doing right. uh, things in, a, in an interesting way. We have obviously some limitations in, in some locations, uh, but they just wanted more data. And so right. when we worked with our scientific partner and developed this strip inside the hives and and kind of using the fact that the bees are visiting all these different locations and right. bring back that information at the hive, uh, and particularly on this particular strip that we put in the hive for a few weeks, um, it was just to kind of solve that gap on how do you get just a, an additional set of data that you can use uh, and that you can show back to your tenants and all that too, right? So well, bees are a bees are a very good way to do that. The uh, uh, we've got a researcher uh, here at the University of Montana who has described them as flying dust mops, and that's <laughs> that's pretty accurate. They pick up everything in their environment from from road grit, concrete dust off construction sites, uh, of course, all the pollen grains and whatever else they've been uh, uh, they've been exposed to. So if you are if you are looking at residues in a beehive, uh, let's assume we're talking about one that doesn't get commercially trucked to almond orchards in California and, you know, apple orchards in Washington and blueberries in Oregon and all that. Uh, but that beehive is going to give you a pretty good idea of what's going on within two or three miles uh, of that of that particular site. Uh, not only what's going on on your site, but also what's going on in the in the immediate environment. Yeah. Well, um, for those that are listening that are interested, there'll be the contact information after and something we can decide. And as you said, it's always site specific. So that's why uh, the recommendations after all will be site site specific, right? Um, let's okay, so let's move into some kind of some practical things here that that buildings can do. And I, and the, the big one I want to touch on here is is um, integrated pest uh, uh, management um, IPM. Um, can you talk us through kind of the methodology and why? why this is something that would be, um, you know, very important or very interesting for a building to pursue, right? 
Sure. Integrated pest management came out of uh, came out of agriculture, and it was based on uh, developing a model for how much damage the crop could sustain if uh, before there was economic loss, and then only treating when you hit that when you hit that threshold. So there was a lot of sampling, a lot of a lot of data collection, a lot of inspection. Uh, translating that over to a uh, uh, over to a structural environment essentially takes the the same elements. You you inspect, you figure out what the pest is. Uh, you've got little small flying bugs. Well, they could be they could be uh, beetles. They could be something developing uh, in a mouse nest or an accumulation of acorns in the in one of the one of the uh, vents or or air air systems uh, could be stored food could be I've seen I've seen dead animals in attics produce lots of lots of uh, stored product pests um, you've got to know what it is it's not just an ant is it an ant that feeds on protein is it an ant that feeds on on uh, uh, sugars where does it live what kind of environments does it like once you've done that a lot of times you can just eliminate the eliminate the environment um, get rid of whatever it is that's causing the pest, and you don't have to, you don't have to use any chemical treatment at all. And that's that's the goal of integrated pest management is to use all of these other, all of these other systems, all of these other tactics to knock that population down or exclude it before you resort to simply spraying. It's it's easy, it's cheap, it's low skill to hire somebody to come out with a with a spray can and treat the baseboards. It doesn't usually solve the problem, and it, in my opinion, it unnecessarily that kind of practice unnecessarily exposes people to whatever residues of the product you're putting out is. Yeah, and I think you know what, what I'm hearing from uh, building operators is that the the tenants inside the building have become more aware on the impact that some of these, um, you know, um, toxic chemicals can have on, on them, on the environment. And so, um, yes. you know, what, what would have been, you know, probably, um, perfectly acceptable for tenants just come in quickly and solve it, um, uh, is, is now less yeah. because, because tenants are actually interested in, in having a building that has to have that, that safe environment, uh, sorry, that has this, uh, healthy environment and that is doing things in a, in a, you know, in a, um, in a practice that will be good for yeah. them and for their, for their, for their, um, well, and so, some of that Alex is just simply because things are better than mm -hmm. they were 20, 30 years ago. It is not, uh, uh, we are working on the last few percentage points of, of risk. We're not putting out organophosphates we're not putting out carbamates we're not putting out these toxic and persistent chemicals especially especially indoors uh there are other other solutions and we we don't have pest problems generally uh to the extent because our construction is so much better and we we have learned about these things we don't have the kind of pest problems that would provoke someone just to say you know come hose it down get mm -hmm. rid of them make them go away yeah, which is a which is a good thing, and and then that's showing progress. that. Yeah, I think that's progress. And then showing that progress to tenants and having a way to report back onto it and share that um, in a in a concrete way, I think goes yeah. goes a long way today too, right? Um, okay, so IPM, I think, in and you know, honestly, I think a lot of the the people on the call would probably be using some form of this, considering it's it's already um, kind of widely spread in the in the kind of property management world. But something just to touch on. If we move to just kind of different and other alternatives apart from IPM, um, you know what what what's what's out there and, and other kind of concrete things that that um, would be interesting to think through if if uh, if you are a property manager on the call or a building owner on the call here, um, you know what are the other directions I guess that you would point point at? Well, I think I think that really everything you have listed falls under. Uh, falls under integrated pest management. I mean, using lower lower risk products. If you have a if you have a uh, what we would call a twenty five B product, um, uh, uh, one of the essential oils, one of those other things that is generally recognized as safe as the federal definition. Um, yeah, by all means, use use that instead of a synthetic insecticide. If you can 
use uh, mechanical control. If you can apply a band of caulk around the windows and that solves your solves your roach problem, great. That's permanent. It's it's cheap in the long in the long run. Uh, you know, if you can <laughs> persuade everybody to keep the break room clean, perhaps you can avoid you know having problems uh, problems there. You know, a couple of potato chips kicked under the refrigerator will support a, an awful lot of roaches for a long time. Yeah. And I, no, I want to touch on the cultural practices here because it, it kind of touches on the point I was just sharing there with kind of uh, um, how tenants are perceiving their workplace. And, and um, you know, we, we have one customer that changed entirely how they were doing their landscaping, going from, a, a, you know, essentially a completely cut grass with the expectation right. that that was what, what the tenants wanted, which requires, you know, a, a lot of inputs in order to make that. It's actually more expensive, right, to keep it like that. It is, yeah. Have something... Uh, and this particular um, owner uh, across the entire portfolio did this campaign, said, part in the weeds, we're feeding the bees. And for, over, you know, two months, let essentially their lawns grow out and you know, kind of flowers came out uh, and then used it as a, as a marketing initiative, right? So something that would have been seen as completely inappropriate uh, is now uh, and, and more expensive to, to keep as that kind of clean lawn yeah. with a less expensive, less intrusive, less kind of uh, uh, inputs. Um, actually transform that into kind of a marketing campaign for tenants that now said, oh, wonderful, the, the building's doing something positive for um, for the bees. So I think it's also interesting to think through things that are kind of outside a little bit of the IPM world but that fall into why we're doing certain things in the first place for for these tenants that are uh, uh, going into these buildings every day, right? Well, a lot of that is is just educational. Yeah. Uh, it is educational and cultural. And, you know, culture is a very, very hard thing to, uh, to change. Um, we... Uh, I briefly lived in a neighborhood that had a homeowners association. They did not like uh, all of the weeds and flower and plants and things in the yard. I thought it was bee habitat. They thought it was a mess. Uh, and that's that's a hard perception to to change. There's an awful lot of folks out there who their ideal is a manicured green lawn without a without a flower in sight. Yeah, well, I'm happy at least. Two people on this call are uh, yeah. <laughs> are interested in that. Yeah. Um, okay, we're kind of wrapping up here with, with some. I just want to kind of wrap up a little bit on here on what, where to start based on some of the stuff that you just uh, that you just shared. So um, you talked about um, kind of implementing integrated pest management and in and IPM and making sure that that was kind of the the first uh, first step. Right. Um, and again, we're trying to you know. Uh, work against the non-compliance, the tenant environmental risk, and the ballot billing value. So IPM kind of fits those those three boxes. Uh, great, great place to start. You talked about monitoring and regular inspections. I talked a little bit about the bio, the, the monitoring with the bees that we're doing now so that we can go kind of the extra mile and show to tenants that that was done on site and that we're using and leveraging something that's already on site to do that monitoring. Uh, obviously it's not the only monitoring, but it's a it's a it's a it's a big piece in terms of the storytelling too. And then um, I think, Cam, you know, you're obviously an expert on the matter. I think uh, people walking away from this call, it's it's making sure that they have the right experts around the table, uh, people such as yourself or people that are, are in the industry that can help, um, you know, one, uh, make the changes, but also help on the communication and help make sure that the, you know, on our last point here on cultural changes, make sure that they're making the most from a communication perspective also from tenants once they've taken those big steps uh, forward, right? Is there anything else, Cam, you would add on the kind of where to start? I, I would I would say your one of your points is partner with experts. I would I would point out that the the landscaping industry and especially the structural pest control industry has been changing for decades from uh, from a less uh, a lower level of expertise, shall we say to some pretty high tech, uh, pretty well-informed stuff. There are a lot of companies out there that have uh, that have master's level, PhD level entomologists on staff. Uh, I, I have several of the people I went to school with are either working for or have started very successful pest control businesses. And they don't put out a whole lot of pesticides. Mm. Uh, they do a lot of cultural control. They do a lot of uh, what you would loosely call uh, integrated management because they have the they have the expertise if if you're running a, a commercial building maintaining a commercial building and your pest control guy shows up with his company name on the side of his truck with electrician's tape and yes i've seen that more than once 
uh, he's probably not packing the level of expertise that you would want in your building. But your comment is uh, you've seen a lot more now bringing in that expertise and have those people yes. on staff and so partnering with them, asking yeah. the right question, bringing up IPM, bringing up monitoring. Bringing there up, is no um, shortage it, of expert expert companies out there, very, very good companies out there in in landscaping and, and pest control. Cam, thank you so much for um, for uh, answering the questions and um, uh, being with us today. Um, small promotion for two webinars that we have um, up and coming. It's our webinar season. And September 4th, next uh, week, uh, I'll be running a webinar with uh, uh, Dan Winters, who um, uh, is from GRESB um, and has been with GRESB for the last 10 years. Um, and so we'll talk through uh, some of the changes that are happening on the GRASB side from a biodiversity standpoint uh, and how that might affect uh, GRASB um, uh, surveys in the near future. So you're going to get a lot of hot hot uh, takes there uh, next week. And then a few weeks later, we're doing a webinar with Briam, um, Briam Big Certification, Green Builder Certification um, uh, in Europe, but we'll be talking with the U.S. team. And so everything around building certification specifically related to Briam. So stay tuned for those two webinars. We have experts, really very knowledgeable people, as we did today with Cam, that'll be joining. Uh, and uh, we uh, uh, look forward to seeing you there. Um, thank you for all that have joined. Um, great to have uh, 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 all the particip participants today. And we'll catch you at the uh, next webinar. Thanks, Cam. Yes, sir. Thank you.